I'm going to go through an example now, unless there are any questions about this. No, pretty straightforward, right? It seems straightforward, but there are some subtleties that we'll get to shortly. So the expected value of the uh, risk-adjusted NPV can be approximated by the sample mean of your hundred or thousand or million realizations. So when you take an average of this, what that's giving you is an estimate of the theoretical population expectation of this random variable. In general, you can't calculate that easily, uh, theoretically. But when you run a simulation, all you need to do is to run a hundred or a thousand of these trials, calculate the mean, and now you've got a pretty good estimate. How good an estimate is it? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. All right? But the point is that when you calculate the average across your simulations, that average is meant to be an, an estimator to the theoretical expected NPV, right? So in, in the exact same way that when you calculate the average of anything, that average is meant to be an estimator of the population expectation, right? All right, now we can estimate the variance of your risk-adjusted net present value by calculating the sample variance and so on. And it turns out that these estimators are generally very good. Why? It's because the assumptions of typical statistical estimation, namely that you have independent and identically distributed random variables, holds because you're simulating independent and identically distributed random variables. Does that make sense to you guys? Questions? OK. Well, so we're going to do an example. The example is one that you've already seen. It's the real option example from a couple of classes ago. But now what I'm going to do is replace the binary outcome, you know, success or failure. I'm going to replace it with a random variable. And let, let's just go through it. So remember, we're thinking about buying manufacturing facilities to produce a drug for which we just received FDA approval. The net profit per year is $200 million today. But remember, next year, because of some new legislation, there's some risk. And the risk is that it's going to have a mean of $200 million, but a standard deviation of 50. Remember, the example that we gave originally was it could be either 200 or I think it was, it, was it 50? Uh, or 100 or 300, right. The average was 200, but there was two possible outcomes, 100 or 300. Here, I don't know what the outcome is, but I'm modeling it as a normal random variable. It's got a mean of 200 and a standard deviation of 50. OK? So just back of the envelope, tell me, 95% of the time, what is the price likely to give you in terms of the revenue next year or the profit next year? 95% of the time, what will the profits likely be? Um, between 100 and 300. Yes, exactly. How did you get that? Um, so you just multiply standard deviation by almost 2. and right. yeah, 1.96. Yeah, or 2, exactly. So the standard deviation is 50 million. 2 times that is 100 million. You know that 95% of the time it's going to be between 100 and 300. So this is not that different from what we did last time with the, with the Bernoulli trial. But the nice thing about this is that we can have all sorts of values in between. OK, so same thing as last time. The cost of the facilities is $1.5 billion today or $1.65 billion next year. Should we purchase it today or wait a year? Assume a discount rate of 10%. But here now, I'm going to ask you some different questions than before. I'm going to ask you, what's the likelihood I'm going to lose money on this deal? And Last time, there were only two possibilities. But here, we have a more nuanced question that we're asking. And if the decision is to wait a year, what's the chance of outperforming the NPV of an immediate purchase? And what if the standard deviation of the profits is $150 million instead of 50? In other words, what if, what if we really don't know what the profits could be? It could be zero, or it could be much, much higher. So if there's a lot more risk in the market, all right, so let's, let's go through the exercise. I'm going to simulate 100 realizations of your net profit. So the random variable here 
is this x, right? That's the 200 million with a mean of 200 million and a standard deviation of 50. So, so that's the thing that you want to simulate, OK? So I can simulate 100 realizations of next year's net profit. And for each one of them, each one of these realizations, I'm going to plug it into this equation and calculate the risk-adjusted NPV, all right? And after I get 100 of these, I'm going to analyze the property of the 100 of them and then make a decision. So I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. But, but do, you ever, do you understand what the exercise is? And do you understand that you can do this in Excel, right? It's like 100, 100 cells. And each one is an RND, open paren, close paren, which is a random variable between 0 and 1. You have to take the inverse of the normal distribution function to get a normal random variable, but that's easy to do because that's also an Excel function. So you can do this in Excel right now. So let's do this. If we plug in for these 100 random variables, this is what we get. This is the distribution of risk-adjusted NPV. Okay? That's the histogram. The mean is 200, the standard deviation is 50, and I'm doing 100 trials. So that's what it looks like. And if you calculate the expected risk-adjusted NPV of this, oh, sorry, this is the actual x1 that I'm simulating, and this is the actual risk-adjusted NPV. So the expected risk-adjusted NPV is 487 million. So if you're just using the expected risk-adjusted NPV, go for it, right? That's a good deal. Go ahead. The probability of loss, well, you can actually calculate that right here. You're looking at all of the realized values of risk-adjusted NPV that's less than zero, and that's exactly 21%. So I can tell you with this simulation, I can tell you now what the likelihood is you're going to lose money according to these assumptions, 21%. All right? And on top of that, the probability that I'm going to go greater than 700, a third. I've got a third of a chance of making more than 700, which is really good. Right? This gives me more information. Now, this is not magic. The reason it's giving you more information is you, you put in more information. You put in a distribution that's normal with a particular standard deviation. So all of your results are dependent on those assumptions. If you are wrong about those assumptions, these inferences will be wrong also. So garbage in, garbage out. Keep that in mind. And that's, that's part of the problem with simulation. Simulation requires that you actually be correct about the data generating process. That's what we call it when you simulate the randomness. All right. So now let me go to the last part of the question that I asked you, which is what happens if the standard deviation is not 50, but it's 150? So now the, the x variable, the net profit next year, looks like this. So I simulated 100 with a uh, standard deviation 150, and I plotted a histogram, so it looks like a mess. It's, it's much wider spread out, right? Not, not, not nearly as neat as this. And I've used the same scale for both of these so you can compare apples to apples. All right, now let's suppose the real world looks like this. Things have gotten a lot less certain. Who knows why? Maybe you, know, you have a, a, a different... Um, you know, uh, legal infrastructure that's about to come online. You've got, you know, dysfunction in Congress. You don't know what's going to happen. If that occurs, now look at this. The expected risk-adjusted NPV has almost doubled. Did we make a mistake? That's very strange. All I did was to increase the risk of my net profit. Now, it looks like I'm making money out of nothing. How, how could that be? Anybody? What's the intuition for that? Because you have more outliers that are... I do. I have more outliers, but, but wait, don't I have more outliers both left and right? Yeah, Maria? The higher the risk, the higher the return. The higher the risk, the higher the return in general for, for equilibrium models, you're right, but there's no equilibrium going on here, which is a little weird, right? So if it were a CAPM model, you're right, that the higher the risk, the higher the return. But we don't have any CAPM going on. I didn't assume that CAPM was going on. So you're on the right track, but it's a simpler explanation that has to do with the way that we're calculating this, uh, 
Yeah, Holly? Um, is that you, you eliminated the left the tail of the, of the NPV? Exactly, yeah. So, so you're right that it's risk adjusted, but it's a risk adjustment that's actually having to do with the fact that you get to do this. You get to take the maximum because you don't need to buy this plant until after next year. So this optionality is what's giving you that boost. And now you really see the real option value going on here, right? And why it pays to be able to wait a year. And it also suggests that actually, if you have this kind of an option, you welcome uncertainty. You want a lot of the randomness to go on. Now, that's easier said than done. Let me go through the exercise with you, and let me ask whether you really, really want that. Okay. So this almost double the risk-adjusted net present value. But now, the variance is more than doubled. And check this out. The probability of loss is 45%. You have a 45% of losing money. So does this still look good to you? You still want this? It's got much higher mean. But you've got a very high probability of loss, almost half. On the other hand, the probability of making more than $700 million on this deal is now 40%. It's greater than the 32%. There's no right or wrong answer here because it's actually a matter of risk preferences. So just by a show of hands, let me ask you, if you could choose. So if you could actually choose between these two projects, let's say they were competing you know, side by side. You could actually invest in a drug that had the left profile versus the right profile, two different competing projects. How many people would pick the first project? And how about the second one? Yeah, so that's actually, that was at my, my impression as well. The second one, it looks good, but it's actually pretty risky. And if you're thinking about drug development, given how much money that's involved, given how many lives are at stake, you actually tend to be more risk averse. I'm not saying whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is a thing. It's a thing people in this business tend to be risk averse because they're thinking in terms of lives. And from a financial perspective, that's not true. If, if I actually, instead of talking about drug development, if I told you that the left side was you know, stock A and the right side was stock B, we'd actually get a different answer. So I just want to tell you about that. The psychology of drug development is different than other businesses. And you've got to take that into account when you make these decisions and you talk to the various different stakeholders in this industry.